Hi everyone. I've always been insanely jealous of those people who were able to have YouTube and Zoom cats. And so many of you know that my mom had an accident and has been put into uh, nursing care. And this is my mom's cat. He's living with me right now and he's now my new Zoom star, aren't you? Yes, you are. Anyways, <laughs> I had to take a little bit of a break uh, from uh, producing content for you, but uh, I'm really excited to be back. And you'll notice there's a logo and that logo is from the Food Systems Game Changers Lab. And right before my mom's accident, I was uh, invited to be part of Cohort 21, the Food Systems Education Working Group, and work on different systems-based approaches for food systems education. You've heard me say this before. At the root of any of the problems and any of the challenges that we're seeing in the food system and any of the opportunities is human systems. And we need to think about the people that are involved in the food industry and the food sector and just people who are consuming food and think about the level of skill and competency that they have to be able to participate. So I'm really excited to be working with the team on the Food Systems Education Group. And again, uh, just a thank you to our sponsors, Thought for Food, the Rockefeller Foundation, IDEO and EAT. And I'm going to jump over to my PowerPoint because how did I get involved in the Food Systems Game Changers Lab? Well, it was because of this YouTube channel and all of the content that I've been producing for you, my friends and viewers and students around the world. Um, this is how I got involved. And so I'm going to follow the same pattern as before. And we're going to jump back to the PowerPoint and talk a little bit today about food systems education. So something that we've been talking about in the Food Systems Education Working Group is the concept of food extension education. And the idea of food extension or extension education, you may hear a few different terms tossed around. Extension or cooperative extension or extension education. The idea behind this is having education as a public good and a public service targeted towards the general public or certain um, participant groups within the community for the purposes of improving livelihoods and improving um, economic outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit about the history in a minute, but let's follow our normal CBET model. Those of you who've been following along on the video series um, have seen my recent videos have been talking about competency-based education and training. And so this is a CBET model. I'm telling you at the end of this video, you will be able to. <laughs> and that's a CBET technique. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to describe the cooperative extension movement for agriculture education. We'll debate why cooperative extension has merit, but needs revitalization and reinvention from the historical model. And we'll evaluate by thematic analysis, the structural elements of a modernized food systems education system. And I know some people have said, these videos are really over my head. And I'm like, you know what? I am breaking one of my own cardinal rules. Something that good curriculum designers do is they think about who is their archetypal participant or that, that who is that target audience and make sure that they are targeting that module. And historically, most of my modules have been targeted towards undergraduate uh, food science students. Recently, my modules have been uh, converting over to food science educators. And so I should add a second line here. Who is this module designed for? And in this case, this module is designed for food systems analysts, organizational leaders and educators. And I always encourage anyone, keep on learning. If you want to become a food systems educator, well, watch. Um, I know I have some children and teenagers who watch these videos as well. And this is part of your learning and growing too. So let's jump ahead. Cooperative extension was uh, initially developed in the United States under the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. And um, there have been a wide variety of different models that have uh, encouraged education in agriculture, but I'm going to speak specifically about the American experience. Why? Because when I went to graduate school in the United States, I went to Iowa State University, and extension services was a really critical part of the, the work that I was doing in the Cooperative Research Extension um, State Service, um, the CSRES system, which is now the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture, or NEFA. Anyways, um, Cooperative Extension was an, 
part of the expansion of the Land Grants Institution or Morrill Act of 1862. Now, the Morrill Act has, um, it has a long and storied history, and some of it's not so great, especially in terms of Indigenous and Native American um, uh, assimilation. But the idea behind the land grant institutions was that um, every state was given a certain parcel of land that was available for development into an institution that would be focused on agricultural technology. And as such, these local schools, um, in many cases, they were called institutes. In some cases, they were called colleges. Other cases, they were called universities. But the idea was to have a local state-based school where there would be local capacity building for communities in agriculture, in home economics, in engineering technology, and youth skills development. And the, the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 in particular uh, codified that and uh, ensured that there was going to be public funding available for these initiatives. The key principle is that it was intended to be publicly accessible and competency-based education. So we've talked about competency-based education. The idea that at the end of taking that course or taking a learning resource from the extension service that you would be competent and capable of performing new skills. And another piece of that puzzle is that it was focused on community level educators working with people in self-organizing learning environments. And it was based off of science and evidence-based learning. So the idea being that, um, you would have scientific educators, professors, um, experts in the field being those educators, providing really good factual information such that the success rate and the, um, the literacy of the community participating in the cooperative education model would be increased as a whole. Now, here are some just some examples of, I mentioned Iowa State University, um, most of the land-grant universities in the United States still have some form of extension and outreach, and the the principle of having it within a post-secondary institution like Iowa State University is that you have access to those subject matter experts, um, and it's part of the mandate of these institutions to have that outreach and uh, teaching component. Another another feature of of uh, extension was the integration of youth. And so the example of 4-H, it's an um, international organization, first, uh, I believe, founded in the United States, but um, also found around the world. But the idea of working with uh, children and youth at the uh, primary and secondary school level to focus on competency-based learning in agricultural technology, home economics, and so on. You'll notice from the model, learn to do by doing is a very competency-based uh, framework. The idea behind 4-H is that you have leaders facilitating young people, many times children or uh, adolescents, facilitating the, them through a variety of different projects so that it is um, that self-organizing learning environment where the students are or the, the youth are going and participating in an informal learning environment, but challenging their zone of proximal development. Then there's another one, which is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. This is uh, produced by the Extension Service at the University of Georgia. And the idea here is to provide scientific and factual information about how to can and preserve fruits and vegetables and meat products and a variety of different uh, products that may be produced in home gardens or home farms and to do it in a safe and uh, sanitary manner. And so to provide evidence-based um, protocols to home canners so that they are not going to be causing foodborne illness. This is a really competency-based framework that these are, these are very useful, practical, and home-based protocols for home-based use. Freely accessible, online, available, and if if it's if it's required, you can even purchase uh, or order at a minimal cost different booklets and uh, manuals that they have produced at different points in time. These are just some examples of extension services that are currently out there. Now, again, as I mentioned before, there are some core principles behind extension education, that it needs to be publicly accessible with public educators and that it's conceived as a common good and as such funded typically by government or other um, 
organizations that are going to encourage full participation by the population. So it's not just, uh, it's not like a typical course. There are some courses where there's a fee for service or an activity fee involved, but in general, it's intended to be in, uh, universally accessible. The principal uh, can have distinct targets, and this is important. We'll talk about this in a few moments, but um, oftentimes when you're developing extension education, you will have a target population that you're going after. So it could be youth. It could be youth within the school system. It could be youth in uh, self-organizing learning environments. You could have the target of healthy eating. You could have targets on agricultural technology or environmental protection. There are extension services that are specifically targeting industrial development. One uh, in Canada is the um, Canadian Food Innovators Network. And the idea being that it's a government-funded network of um, industrial service providers who are coaching and mentoring in the industrial space. It's not targeted to the general public. It's, a t it's targeted to industry. But the idea being that it is very much a public good and therefore accessible to the right stakeholders in a, in a freely accessible format. Oftentimes, extension education is associated with post-secondary institutions, and part of that is historical, but part of it relies on the fact that in many cases you need the infrastructure or the technology to be able to demonstrate the uh, competencies in other cases, it's the access to subject matter experts, such as professors or scientists who are able to validate the content that's going to be presented. But um, historically, it was associated with post-secondary institutions. Um, many of you know that years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, when I joined Niagara College, I joined uh, to, uh, with two mandates, one to uh, do the food science education, but secondly, to help found the uh, Technology Access Centre for Food and Beverage Innovation. And my original strategic uh, vision for the organization was based off of extension education. The idea being that you would have this uh, centre with scientists, with professors, with subject matter experts in food manufacturing, and you'd be able to pick up the phone and call them and discuss your problems and carry on with your work such that your your business would thrive. And uh, I've stepped back, so I'm focused more on education and training and a little bit less on the on the research side, but I still really value the model that's there, which is much more fee-for-service. So what has happened to extension? Well, in, in many countries that had extension services, uh, I'm, I'm referring to a paper here which is called The End of the Beginning and the Beginning of the End, The Decline of Public Agricultural Extension in Ontario, and it was written by Milburn, Mully, and Klein. But um, the idea behind extension was that most of it historically was focused on agricultural technology development and agricultural economics. And it was, it was very focused on the, um, the productivity of farms. And it wasn't uh, nearly as focused on food systems, environment, health, and food literacy. And this is problematic because um, if you think about the percent of uh, individuals who'd be participating in extension services, you would see a decline over time because the number of people involved in agriculture is declining and the rural populations are declining as well. And so when governments are doing those return on investment analyses, they will often say, well, we're only impacting a few number within the population. It would make much more sense to impact a much larger swath of the population, forgetting that food impacts everyone. <laughs> but the idea uh, so many governments have is that we've got to impact as many people as possible. Well, food is impacting everyone fundamentally, and that is something that we need to address uh, when thinking about reinvigorating or reinvesting in an, in an extension model. Um, another aspect to this is that food is uh, seen as a dominant rural industry, and the urban, the urban aspect of food and the aspect of universal sustainability for, for everyone, urban, rural, or in between, it is very much understated. And I think that there's opportunities for um, reinventing the, the idea of what is food systems and who participates in food systems and who are the who are the individuals who require the capacity building. 
Last but not least, um, as, as we discussed, extension services are often attached to post-secondary institutions, to colleges, institutes, and universities. And um, over the past couple decades, there's been far more emphasis on uh, the, the publisher parish mindset and far more emphasis on um, part-time instructors working within these facilities. And so these are people who have less time to be able to invest in the public education component, which often is done on a voluntary basis. Um, and as such, it's, it's a bit challenging when uh, extension type uh, knowledge transfer is not seen as a valued activity. I admittedly, there are institutions that do value it and do consider it part of the the, the tenure evaluation within universities. But in general, this public education role is, is undervalued and understated. And as such, post-secondary institutions need to ask that core question, how do we value this, this role of public educators and public intellectuals within their, within their realm and value their contribution? So, I did a quick thematic analysis. Uh, I, <laughs> I've had the fun of uh, uh, participating in the cohort meetings uh, with our uh, Food Systems Game Changers Lab, and I'm hearing over and over again within our within our conversations some key themes emerging in those conversations. A lot of our challenge when we're when we're trying to develop a consensus is that we have a wide variety of different organizations who represent a wide variety of learners. Within education and curriculum development and education programming, you need to know who is your learner and be very targeted to that learner. You need to understand who that learner's or what that learner's goal is and what's their motivation for participation. You also need to know what the learning taxonomy is, and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But the idea being what level of skill do they come in with? What level of skill do you need them to have? leaving the system and what are those sort of threading themes in terms of getting them to the skill level that you need. Then we need to also think where is that learning occurring with respect to the food value chain and we have within our cohort people who are on the environment and um, ecosystems base of the food value chain, people within agriculture, people within food processing and distribution, people within food service, and then a lot of people focused on the consumer experience. And I haven't noticed if we've got anyone focused on the waste and the regenerative aspect of how do we um, focus on the, the end products of, of the food system and, and minimize the environmental impact. But that cycle is really important. Where are you in that food value chain? is another dimension of the thematic analysis. Last but not least, how do we, I'm, I'm using some SOTL terms, uh, the, the, the study of teaching and learning. SOTL is, uh, is a concept, we used to use the term pedagogy, and pedagogy implies that we're, we're teaching children, but SOTL is the idea that we are thinking about the teaching and learning uh, a strategy and we are thinking about it from a very academic perspective but how do we take our learning approach from being very didactic where it's just that talking head to changing uh, it into a knowledge skills and attitudes framework and then converting it into what we call a competency base or a CBET basis. CBET implies that when someone has participated in that learning module that they will be able to do a new skill and be able to use it in a meaningful way. And oftentimes, uh, going back to that didactic model, you'll, you'll hear about things and you'll go, well, I've, I feel like I've, I've learned something and I have more knowledge, but can you convert that knowledge into a meaningful application? That is a really important aspect from a curriculum design perspective. So let's jump into these, these different themes. Who's your learner? So we need to know who's that archetypal participant. I work at a post-secondary institution, and so most of my archetypal participants are high school students. They would have graduated from high school recently um, and are interested in career development. So they want to come and study food science because they are interested in joining the food manufacturing sector. In other cases, your archetypal participant may be children. It may be older adults. It may be... Um, I, I, I run a lot of programs where... Um, 
my archetypal participants are actual food science professors who are participating in uh, social based uh, activities so that they can gain more skills in competency based education and training. And so it's important to think who that archetypal participant is and think about what skills they come with to start with and what skills do you want them to have after they've accomplished your course or after they've accomplished the learning tools that you're providing to them. It's important to think about what is possible for people to learn at different levels of age and maturity. That said, I'm always, I'm always one to say that stretch one's mind and stretch one's goals and ability to learn. But there is aspects to what are people uh, mentally and uh, physically capable of learning at different levels of maturity. I often use the term workers, but we need to think about occupational task assessment and what skills and tasks do we need people to be able to do. And I use workers with aster or not with asters, with apostrophes, because I'm when I say workers, oftentimes it could be children. They're not workers, but I think of my students as workers. But that aspect of do is important. What skills do they need to be able to do at the end of that course? And are you able to stretch those skills so that we're improving the sector? Oftentimes, um, when I'm doing programming in uh, curriculum development, I'm working with people who will pull up a textbook and they'll say, well, this is what's in the textbook. This is what we're going to learn. And I'm like, but this textbook maybe was written 20 years ago. Fantastic. What do we need to have from a future forward and innovation mindset uh, to be able to improve the system as a whole. So that's that's a little bit of dreaming that you need to think about. Now, um, this is a quick diagram, but oftentimes when we're thinking about training or education programs, we have a taxonomy of what level of skills do we need to provide. And so in some cases, we're just providing life skills. These are the, going to be the skills that are going to make one in their home or in their in their family or in their uh, community have a better life. But then oftentimes these skills transfer into employability skills. So for example, say food handling could be considered a life skill. It could also be an employability skill where say food handling can uh, be something that uh, converts into food service uh, opportunities, working in food manufacturing, or perhaps even uh, from an uh, entrepreneurship perspective. If someone has the skill of safe food handling, it becomes an employability skill. Then we transition into what we consider vocational skills. This is where we're taking it up a notch from an employability. So we're, it's not just something that's generally employable, but we're looking at very specific to the vocation. And then there are specialist skills. And this is where we're looking at very discrete and very advanced level skills. But you have this sort of taxonomy that you need to be able to think dis, uh, very deliberately who is that who is that archetypal participant what are the skills that they had coming in and you can't just take uh, a kid off the street and say well we're going to turn you into a HACCP coordinator that's a very uh, specialist vocational skill set that yes you can take a kid off the street and give them the right give them the right stepping stones to accomplish it you can get them to that specialist skill set but you can't just say let's 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 teach you HACCP and in 8 hours turn someone straight off the street into a HACCP coordinator there is this natural progression of skill sets that needs to be accumulative and I mentioned before the zone of proximal development. The idea, this is a model developed about 100 years ago by Lev Vygotsky, in, but, and it was much more a pedagogical model, model, but it works on everyone. There is an aspect of what can that learner do by themselves? What do they need the teacher or the instructor to do with them? And then how far are you challenging them such that they can no longer do that skill on their own? Um, or do it even, pardon me, they get frustrated to the point that they can no longer do that learning. I'm sure you've been in a course where you've gotten in there and the teacher says, well, this is easy. I I can do this assignment in five, ten minutes. And you're just sitting there beating, your, beating yourself uh, up saying, there's no way in God's green earth I could ever do that. That's where we're pushing into that learner cannot do space. 
it, as a as a education developer, you need to think very deliberately. What is that zone of proximal development? What is challenging people to um, get out of that space of comfort and challenging them to do something new? But with the guidance of the instructional materials and the training materials and the the mentorship of the instructor that's that's with them, versus how far do you push them so that they can no longer do that skill? And that's an important that's an important balancing act that um, good educational developers need to focus on. I mentioned before too learning taxonomy. This is Benjamin Bloom's uh, Bloom's taxonomy, but the idea being when thinking about developing. Um, any sort of curriculum, you are developing learning outcomes. So you notice from the beginning of my videos, I always say at the end of this video, you will be able to do. In general, I'm trying to have my my uh, taxonomy pushing into this higher level. That said, given the limitations of online learning, oftentimes we are pushing down into this remembering and understanding taxonomy because um, it, it, the online learning environment is very much a didactic space. It's just, it. I'm a talking head. <laughs> I wish there was a lot more interaction, but a lot of these require case studies. They require hands-on learning. They require much more um, investment in community to be able to uh, develop these higher order thinking skills. But it's important to think about when I'm doing this curriculum development or developing an education system, what is that taxonomy that I want my student to be able to participate or be able to accomplish at the end of my program? And then, of course, we do need to think about that systems thinking. Historically, all of these different education systems have been built on traditional models, and we need to reinvent and think bigger, think much more about what are all of the elements that are going to be important for a sustainable food system moving forward? And all of those different points of contact. I'm not going to dwell on this one because um, we've had lots and lots of dialogue on this one. But so I've talked a lot about occupational competency, but the idea in really effective learning models is that at the end of that learning model, people will be able to do a task or a job. And I know I keep saying jobs and workers, but is, uh, for example, is the job of a of a eight year old child to be able to prepare lunch for themselves? Is the job of a um, fourteen year old who now has pocket change and can go to the corner store to be able is is their occupational competency to be able to make good choices when it comes to healthy eating? These competencies. I know I'm focused a lot on vocational and specialist skills training, but is it our job to eat well and to eat healthy and to eat in an environmentally sustainable way? Perhaps that's the sort of mindset that we need to think about. Is our job as a society to eat well in a way that's responsible for ourselves and responsible for the earth and responsible for the communities around us? So competency-based frameworks work really well if we think about what are the occupational tasks that each segment of the population needs to have. Now, competency-based curriculum, based on this is UNESCO's International Bureau of Education's definitions, but they focus on um, very discrete learning outcomes so that we have a, have a mapping of what those skills and abilities are going to be after going through that learning process. You need to think about the knowledge, skills, and attitudes applied to those learners. And it's going to be less focused on that traditional subject content. This is why I love competency-based curriculum, because it has a lot of space for innovation. It's very learner-centered, and, and it's meant to be adaptive to the changing needs of the students, teachers, and society. Hey, sounds like exactly what we're working on, changing needs of students, teachers, and society. And the learning activities are chosen very deliberately so that there's an uh, application of knowledge, skills, and attitudes to situations in everyday life. And what is everyday life? Well, that's dependent on that archetypal participant. If my participant is a is a 10-year-old child, their everyday life is very different than, let's say, a professor of food science or the everyday life of a food manufacturing worker or the everyday life of an agricultural worker in South Vietnam. This photo is from a workshop that I was doing in uh, the South Vietnam um, area, and you can see all of our um, occupational task assessment on the wall back there. 
Occupational task assessment it really comes down to asking that core question. What does the typical worker do on the job? And again, I'm using worker with a very broad definition, but what does that person need to be able to do? And this takes a very keen eye. You have to think about what tasks are they doing frequently? What tasks do they need to know about their low frequency? And so um, if they're low frequency, is there a criticality to that task? If, if someone were to do a task very frequently, they're likely going to become masters at that task, if we go back to that Bloom's taxonomy. Um, but there are low frequency tasks that have a high criticality. And so we need to think about um, emphasizing those, those tasks that either are high frequency or that have high criticality as our priorities within the education and training model that we're developing. So there are certain tasks that may be done very infrequently, but if they're done wrong, they can cause a major problem. And so we do need to think very deliberately, who is that archetype? what tasks they need to be uh, doing for a successful employability. And I know, again, successful, successful life, if I can use that general term too. And last but not least, we do have this aspect of, uh, as thought leaders, we need to be thinking innovatively about the visioning where our industry or where our food system is going to be evolving over the next five to 10 years. What are these future skills that we need within the workforce and population? And what sector trends are going to be defining that curriculum strategy. That's exactly what our Food Change Makers Lab is all about, is that we are thinking about those future skills, and now we're thinking about how do we develop that training and curriculum strategy. I wanted to leave you with just some different uh, extension type uh, work that I've done. This is a workshop that I did. Uh, uh, it was called La Caserne des Dragons, and uh, I did it for uh, one of the school boards in uh, the Niagara region. Um, and the, these are children in grade six, and they came out to do a product development challenge with me, and they got to make granola bars, and they went through different stations where they got to craft a granola bar. They then had to do a cost of goods analysis. They had to make a nutrition facts label for that product, and last but not least, they had to give a presentation, whether it was the taste of their product, the cost of their product, or the nutrition uh, attributes of their product that was going to sell their granola bar, and then they had to make a a speech. Some of them actually made raps and song and dance routines that were a ton of fun. And um, the students all had a lot of fun. And many of them have told me, um, they've. Uh, it just happens that this is a local school. And so I've gone to visit them again. And these students are now in grade nine. Some of them have told me that they've really had their interest peaked in uh, becoming leaders in the food manufacturing sector, because they came out for one of these early middle school uh, workshops with me. This is a different workshop and these are young adults. They would be students in my uh, food science program. And again, very uh, hands-on workshop that we did on product development where we gave them a uh, template matrix and they had to develop a wide variety of different uh, concepts with that template matrix. And then we did prioritization exercises. And this was picked up by a large multinational company and they took those concepts and turned it into a style book. And that style book was then presented through uh, several thousand grocery stores around uh, North America to help represent the products that these students had developed. But the, the company reached out to us saying, we want to know what do uh, um, young millennials and Gen Zs like when it comes to dessert options. And so you can just see the enthusiasm on everyone's face here. We had a ton of fun workshopping through this. And many of these, uh, many of these people have graduated and have gone on into product development roles. And this is a different workshop, a different archetypal group. But uh, these are food science educators in Vietnam that I worked with with the Vietnam Skills for Education program. And the idea being that we were looking at how do we train food science educators to uh, deliver competency-based education and training? And how do we, how do we um, better equip them for innovation and the greening economies that are, uh, that are coming forward? And so each of these represents a different style of uh, extension type work that I do. And it's important to see the level of engagement, the level of student-centered work, the level of activity that's going on, the level of pride that's generated in every one of these activities as well. That uh, we, we spend a lot of effort thinking about all of these core elements when designing um, extension type activities, and they become extremely impactful in the long run. 
So what would modernized food systems extension look like? Well, we'd look at community-centered food systems educators. Who are those educators? In many cases, they're still, uh, they still may be associated with um, post-secondary institutions, but they could, be, they could be members of the public too. Um, those educators should be focused on public capacity building for environmental good and for the good of self and community. And you want to think about education across the lifespan, across the food value chain, and across the vocational spectrum. So education could be for children, it could be for elders, it could be for um, people within the food service industry, it could be for agricultural workers. All of those are key opportunities, but we need to name them and be discreet and be uh, mindful about who we're targeting. And of course, you have heard me say this before, that competency basis, at the end of this learning experience, you will be able to do a new skill. That I think is really important, that it's not just about the didactic. It's going to be about, it's going to be about having a new skill basis. So I'm going to wrap up this PowerPoint because it's getting a bit long here, but I'm really excited to be part of the Food Systems Game Changers Lab, and I look forward to sharing more content with you moving forward. And you know my, you know my uh, routine comment. I always love to hear from you. I love to hear your comments and questions. And as I'm getting back on track, I look forward to making more content for you on this channel. And moving towards the fall, having lots and lots more videos coming on a variety of different food systems education topics. So take care and we'll talk to you again real soon.